All right, we are going to begin. Um, to get started, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Ryan Hines. I'm the Communications Manager at Biomin. I want to thank you for joining the Biomin Antibiotic Reduction Expert Series. Our topic today is the microbiome and its crucial importance for the health and immunity of the pig. I'm joined by our featured speaker, Dr. Dirk Vanning, Professor of Molecular Immunology at the Royal Veterinary College in the UK. Professor Vanning, thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me and welcome to everybody in these um, kind of strange times. But I think the topic we're covering today is a really important topic, not only for the pig health and the pig industry, but actually you can put it in a wider picture and uh, put it in the frame of One Health. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is, is the microbiome and its crucial importance for the health and immunity of the pigs. But let me start slightly different. Um, if we think about bugs, then in most cases, you can really frame them into three big groups. They're the good ones, the bad ones, and the ugly ones to refer to this very famous Western movie. But when we think about bugs in conjunction with farm animal practices, then the majority of this is that these are not very well reported in the newspaper. So if, for example, you can see here in the Time magazine, the revenge of the killer microbes, or here in the agricultural news cassette, farm antibiotics abuse on the rise. So we need to think about really how we can compete against um, the bugs picking up more and more antibiotic resistance, but at the same time, trying to maintain the health and the resistance to diseases of our farmed animals. So uh, what I would like to do today really is to put the whole um, seminar in the context of which really affects us as well. So there's this famous saying, which apparently is not only in German, but also in England, which is the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Now, why this is the case, I hope to convince you at the end of this seminar that I have an explanation for that. But before we start, um, I would like to see what do you actually know about the microbiome? Yep, that's a great point. Let us ask our live listeners now. We have an audience poll, so you're going to be able to select the one best answer um, that you have to this question. A bit to test your knowledge and as we start into this topic, when do you think that pigs are colonized with the microbiome? Possible answers are during the birth process, in utero, in the first days after birth, and in the first weeks after birth. So we're gonna give everyone in our live audience an opportunity to, to select the one best answer uh, that they feel is appropriate. As you do so, I see those votes are coming in. We're going to have a look at the results, uh, get a little bit of an insight or response from Professor Verdin. Uh, and you'll also be able to ask your questions to Professor Verdin as we continue through here using the chat function, which is located quite close to the, yeah, on your platform here, on your browser, you'll be able to enter those questions that we'll get to during the Q&A. But for now, let's go ahead and pause the voting with three quarters of our attendees voting. Let's see what you had to say. Here are those results. So, Professor Valen, we're going to have a, a chance to hear from you. Uh, wow. We saw that during the birth process was the most popular, followed by in the first days after birth, uh, and then in utero or in the weeks after birth were the, let's say, runners up of this poll. How did well, everyone that's, do? That's, that's actually not a bad result. So, um, we are actually talking about pigs are so to speak, naked at birth. They have no microbiome whatsoever. And the microbiome is um, colonized in the piglet's gut during the birth process. So those 47% who said that were on the right track, and I explained to you in the next slide why this is the case. So if you go back to the presentation, please. So at the beginning, as I said, um, there's really nothing. So we are born absolutely naked with regards to the microbiome and we acquire the microbiome in the first 
minutes or during the birth process in the first minutes after that. So many of the newborns are fecal phagus, which means they eat their own poop. You see some of the animals here which do this. Um, one of them is the piglet. We have <coughs> the main sources of the microbiome in placental animals coming from either, oh, my pointer doesn't work. Ryan, can you do something about this? Um, I'm having a look from my end. We do see your mouse moving. Oh, I can't see it moving. Um, hang on. Pointer options, sorry for that. So we are able to see you advance. Now it works again. So for the main microbiome is actually coming from the birth canal, so the vagina. And this process favors the colonization of the gut with lactobacilli. And <clears throat> when you think about how the birth canal is composed or situated in animals, then you have really the seeding of the microbiome in the piglet with fecal material from the vagina and some bits coming from the from the skin and specifically the fecal material and the vagina are favoring that the offspring is um, seeded with the mother's microbiome and this is really important because the mother is living in a certain environment for a prolonged period of time already and has established a microbiome which is the most suitable for the whole environment. And what I mean by this is, <clears throat> excuse me, what I mean by this is not only the um, disease resistance, but also animal management, animal welfare and feeding. And then this microbiome is further supported by suckling. And what became interesting in the last couple of years, not only in piglets, but also in humans is that actually suckling favors the development of a microbiome which is able to digest breast milk or um, other milk and it also takes up the microbiome which is related on the teeth and again interestingly here we have bifidobacteria so those which are able to um, grow under milk protein conditions and we also have Staph aureus so this is one of the nasty ones which gets colonized fairly early on as well Kissing and licking also favors mother's oral microbiome and that on the skin. And here we have, for example, actin actinobacteria and proteobacteria. Again, these are bacteria involved in the production of short chain fatty acids, which we need for the growth. And finally, we have some bacteria being present in the amniotic fluid and the meconium, and that actually favors the development of lactobacilli. So again, bacteria which can digest milk proteins and milk sugars. And in humans, they've done a really interesting study um, in 2010, where they compared the birthing mode compared to the presence of the microbiome. So what you can see here is in green, the microbiome on the mother, um, green being oral mucosa, dark red being the vagina, the microbiome, dark blue being the microbiome of the skin. And when babies were born via the vaginal way, you can see that their microbiome clusters very nicely with the microbiome of the vagina of the mother. If they were born via cesarean, shown in the light blue, you can see that their microbiome mainly clusters with the skin microbiome of the mother. So the birth mode is actually really important in terms of what microbiome an offspring picks up during the birthing process. And this is summarized here on, on this slide to show you where the microbiome is coming from. This is the same in piglets, um, runs in a shorter time frame, of course, but you can see that the main microbiome comes from the maternal factors being the gut microbiome or microbiota of the mother, um, the vagina in terms of what is present there. And at least in humans for the moment, it's believed that also the microbiome we have in the mouth has a huge impact on the seeding of the microbiome 
um, of the offsprings. At birth, we have a real difference between the microbiome coming through the vaginal delivery, which is mainly lactobacilli, whereas through cesarean delivery, we have mainly staphylococci and propionic bacterium. And you know that these can actually cause problems in um, young children as well as in piglets. And then through the milk consumption, we favor development of bifidobacterium and lactobacilli, whereas through early solid food introduction, we favor the de development of bacteroides and clostrial clostri clostridialis. So here we have clostridium, E. coli, and salmonella in there. And then it depends really on what happens in the toddler or in the piglet on how this all impacts on the postnatal factors aiding the development of the microbiome. And this is something I'm going to show you a bit more in the next slides to come. So the big question really is when, how, and why does the microbiome changes after its establishment? And one of the biggest changing point really is the crossing from the stomach with a very low pH and a relatively low temperature to the duodenum where you have a relatively neutral pH and you rare have a relatively high temperature and not so much oxygen. So what we're developing here is really a fermentation chamber at the crossing from the stomach to the duodenum, so the first part of the small intestine. So this is why we do see that the conditions seen in adults are not the same as we see them as at birth. So the stomach, oral cavity pH changes, um, that is all different in the newborn because we would like to favor the development of a certain microbiome. We do not want to kill everything straight, straight off. There's also a delay in the <clears throat> enterocyte receptor development until after suckling so that attachment of, for example, E. coli bacteria is discouraged. That prevents that these so-called nasty bugs are actually able to colonize the intestine and therefore cause potential damage at the beginning. And we have through breast milk or through colostrum, the favoring of um, bifidobacteria and lactobacilli, again, maintaining slowly the lowering of the pH in the GI tract for these firmicutes and discourage the growth of nasty bacteria. And the microbiome in the infant um, at the end of week one is several locks lower than at the same organs in the adults. So we still have a lot of microbiome as an adult, far more than we have cells in our body. But at the beginning, it is really nearly nothing in there. So we have not a lot of the microbiomes in there. And this, of course, has consequences during the first days of life of a piglet or of a human being. Now, the whole process of microbiome is only fixed in a certain period of time. So here you can see in, in the different colors, you can see different bacteria species in blue, Firmicutes and bacteroidetes, dark green proteobacterium, light green others, and in very light green or yellowish actinobacteria. And you can see that the bacterial diversity increases over age. So that means that at the beginning, we have a fairly undiverse microbiome. And you can see that that spreads out over age. But you can also see that between an adult human being and a geriatric old age person, you have then again a reduction. And this is really important because that has consequences on what old animals or old human beings can actually digest and potentially how the immune system reacts. And you have the same in the neonate, a fairly restricted um, microbiome, however, the individual variability is really high in the neonates. 
And that's the case because our microbiome comes from the mother. So not all mothers have the same microbiome. Therefore, the microbiome is a very individual and personal development, which also has really a problem that we cannot say, what is the microbiome? The microbiome, even on a, on a pig farm, varies from animal to animal to a certain distinct. Yes, you will have um, a majority of microbiome being present, but within this, you have individual changes from one animal to another. And this inter-individual variability then reduces over time. So the older the animal get, the more similar the microbiome becomes if animals are kept under the same environment. So it's not only that in mouse studies, we have shown that the microbiome is individually specific and established very early in life, but the same actually happens in other animals as well. So, as I said, this is the same in the pig, and that means really that our environment has a huge impact on the microbiome. And what has been shown in the pig is that environmental bacteria impact on the composition of the microbiome as well as the development of the innate immune response in the gut. So whatever you have in the environment has an impact on the composition as well as in the development. And what I think is really a very dominant take home message is that a sterile environment in a newborn phase reduces this development as well as reduces the ability of the newborn to react to pathogens. Now, of course, we can discuss what a too sterile environment means, but it is really a point that when we look at England, where we have a lot of pigs being housed outdoors, in general, those piglets are better off in the first weeks after life compared to intensively reared piglets indoors. So are these important issues for the microbiome in us? Yes, they are. So what I'm showing you here, and I guide you through this slide, is the development of the mucosal immune system in the gut as a result of the colonization with the microbiome. So when you look at this first part here on the left side, you can see that um, there's hardly any mucus on the surface of the enterocytes. Yes, we have some B cells and very small pious patches, but we have hardly any maternal, or we have only maternal secreted IgA, so the main antibodies on the mucosal surfaces as well. At birth, we have bacterial colonization, and you can see that at this time point, the mucus starts developing, shown in yellow here, and the bacteria lie really on top of this mucus in a healthy animal. So these are commensal bacterials, and the nasty bacteria are kept in bay by the secretion of um, C of small antimicrobial, antimicrobial peptides, as well as the um, secreted IgA now coming from the piglet itself. At the weaning phase, we have a massive changeover. You can see that the mucus layer shown in yellow here is increasing in thickness. You have a lot more secretory IgA being produced. And you can also see that the pias patches are increasing in size and we have a lot more cells being directly within the enterocyte or underlying the enterocyte. So this means that the more bacteria we obtain, the better our immune system gets primed. And the priming of the mucosal immune system really has a massive impact on the development of the whole immune system as well. And you can see this here. This is a picture from a colleague of mine. Um, they stained the enterocytes in green, the nuclei of the enterocyte shown in blue here. This is the upper layer of the epithelial cells. Um, here you have a follicular structure. And then in red here, you see the mucus on top of the epithelial layers. So this is quite a thick layer. 
And all of this also has an impact on the development of the Pyasha plaque, which is one of the major immune competent sites in the intestine. These are pictures um, we did on piglets born and um, taken at day one to day 35. At day one, so one day after birth, you can see that the enterocytes have relatively long villi to absorb as much nutrients as possible. And down here, you can see the very small pious patches. Now, over the next days of life, you can see that the pious patches are developing. And at day 35, they are really quite large structures, very dominant structures in this micrograph. And you have the villi on top of here, which are now in relation relatively shorter compared to the size of the pious plaques. And all this development is really driven by the colonization of the gut with the microbiome. And it enables us to discriminate between the commensal, the good microbacteria, uh, microbiota we need to digest our food. But at the same time, it educates the immune system to respond to those microbiota, which are more pathogens. So <clears throat> which leads us to the concept of good and bad um, microbiome. And uh, that really is a concept of when we're born and have impact on our microbiome, we have a dysbiotic microbiome, which has massive impact on what happens within our, in our body. And initially, this was really done with patients suffering from inflammatory bowel disease, where it was shown that the microbiome really is different between unhealthy individuals compared to um, old individuals or infirm unhealthy infants and obese. So there is a clear um, concept that the wrong microbiome favors the development of certain disease composition, but it also shows that these disease composition may actually have a positive feedback loop on the wrong microbiome. And what we have here, and I'm sorry for the formatting issues. Um, that's, I guess, the problem when you work on a Mac and then try to use some um, other programs for presentation. You have actually an increase in clostridials, in enterococci, and in ruminococci. So this is really those bacteria which cause massive problems. One of the big issues we have is um, Clostridium difficile in pigs, which was favored to that. We have a decrease in all those bacteria which stimulate anti-inflammatory T cells or so-called regulatory recell T cells and which are necessary to generate short chain fatty acids. We have more proteobacteria and less bacteriates in elderly people. And this is actually the same with elderly animals of poor health. We have a massive overcolonization with staphylococci in beef instead of bifidobacteria, especially in infants born by what's called now an unhealthy cesarean section. We have higher clostridium again in patients with um, Crohn's disease. We have higher actinobacteria in patients with periontal disease. So this shift is really a shift away from the good or oibiotic microbiome to a nasty microbiome. And this goes hand in hand with a reduction of our ability to convert complex fibers to short chain fatty acids and also whether or not we can digest specific sugar components. And what has been shown though, is that the good bacteria, at least in humans, are also able to resolve their allergies faster compared to those which have high levels of E. coli and salmonella. So there have been studies where specific good bacterial strains such as lactobacilli were used in newborns in India, and they have been shown that infant sepsis can be reduced by 40%. Now, if you put this into the context of the pig system, that means that 
potentially the addition of a good microbiome feed early on in life, so within the first days, week of life, can have a very, very positive effect on the development of the piglet. However, the problem is that we can only culture so far a minority of the species, and we don't really know what the other bacteria, which may be in the same species or in the same family, are actually doing. However, <clears throat> it has been shown not only in, in the study in India, but more recently, this is a paper from 2012, that the correct microbiome really protects the gut. So this is a study done in preterm humans, um, so babies born too early, where they were given straight after the too early birth a specific bifi bifidobacterium strain, and that mediated the commensal host interaction through immune modulation and pathogen protection. And what they showed was that the addition of this bifidobacterium actually not only increased the environment for other commensal positive bacteria, but it also increased the immune response against negative bacteria and the products coming out of this bifidobacterium were beneficial for the modulation of other good bacteria to colonize the gut. And you can see the same in a piglet study, which was done in, which was published in 2015. And I only want you to look at the slide, the colors on the slide rather than anything else. So you can see here, this is a seven week old pig, um, a control. You have down here the four different parts of the intestine, so two parts of the small intestine, cecum and the colon. And on the y-axis, you have the percentage occurrence of each of these bacterial strains. And what you can see is that down here, you got streptococci, here you got Prevotella. If you look at a seven-week-old piglet infected with Salmonella, you can see that this specific Prevotella bacterium is largely increased. Streptococci are nearly absent in the small intestine, but are increased in the colon. If you go to nine weeks, nine weeks control again on the left-hand side, nine weeks salmonella infection on the right-hand side. And what you can see here is the streptococci now suddenly take massive over in the small intestine. So a wrong bacterium at the wrong time has massive consequences over time on the composition of the microbiome. And this is not only the case for salmonella, this is also the case for Lusonia infection, Lusonia is one of our, um, I would say, pathogens in pigs on the rice. You can see here a nine week um, control animal, again, jejunium, ileum, cecum, and colon. If these piglets were infected with Lusonia, you can see here a massive change in the composition of specific bacterial family. And this really is a problem that Lusonia is not only impacting on the composition of the microbiome in there, but also it impacts on the development of the immune system. And this is shown in this slide. So in a healthy um, intestine, you have your enterocytes, you have your immune cells, you have your mucus layer on top here, you have a lot of um, immune cells underneath, you have the bacteria being mainly present in the gut lumen. If you infect this pig with Lusonia, you have a really, really big shift. So you can see that the mucus layer is completely destroyed. You have Lusonia within the enterocytes, Lusonia intracellularis, and you have them also in the underlying tissue. You have changes in the immune cell composition, but more importantly, you have also changes in the microbiome composition, where you now have more viruses appearing, more negative bacteria appearing, and through the absence of the mucus, you provide these pathogens with a nice entry point. 
So the impact of the immune system, on the immune system through Lusonia infection is really a reduction of the mucus layer, a local immune suppression, and it has an impact on the microbiome as well. Now, if you want to treat this with antibiotic um, provision, we run into the next problem. And I think this is one of the hottest publication in the last year. It was published in Nature in 2017, where they showed in mice that a low dose penicillin given orally in early life, so in within the first couple of days after birth, induced long-term changes in the gut microbiota, in the development and secretion of brain cytokines, and lastly, on the behavior of these mice as well. And this study really documents extremely well the negative impact of early antibiosis usage on the development of the newborn. And what they also showed um, is how that impacts on the microbiome and the metabolic programming. So what meta metabolomes are secreted in the intestine. And again, please concentrate only on the colors. So the first circle here on the left side is the pretreatment mice. You can see that the firmicodes shown in yellow here are the dominant microbiome. If you give the mice only the vehicle of the antibiotic, you can see there's already an impact which reduces the firmicubes. But if you give them the real thing, the antimicrobial, you can see that this really knocks down the firmicutes. It um, leads to a massive overdevelopment of the proteobacteria, which are the nasty bacteria we don't want. And all of that also has a massive impact on the development or the production of short chain fatty acids. Specifically, you can see that Butyric acid is reduced completely to nearly nothing in those animals which obtained the antimicrobial treatment. And subsequently also butyrate is reduced in these animals which obtained the antimicrobial treatment. And this is really the tendency for all the positive short chain fatty acid, whether the negative short chain fatty acids are increased in those animals with antibiotic treatment coming mainly from the proteobacteria. Now in pigs, this is very similar. We have shown so far that early antibiotic usage, such as giving orally to suckling pigs, reduces the variety of the microbiome, as well as short chain fatty acid production, as well as increased protein fermentation. It also impacts negatively on the composition of the microbiome on respiratory surfaces. So it's not only affecting the microbiome of the gut when given orally. And the same um, was seen under, under other effects, but here I would like to stop again and ask you another question. So over to you, Ryan, again. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so we are going to check everyone's knowledge here with our second audience poll question. Do you think that antibiotics, whatever way given, impact on the microbiome? And I know we've um, just seen one example uh, with the results you shared. Please choose the answer that you think is best suited to the question. The first option is only if given orally, only if given systematically. There's an effect independent of the route of application, or antibiotics do not affect the good microbiome. Please go ahead and take a moment to choose the answer. We have plenty of votes rolling in. I'll also remind everyone, uh, while I have your attention, that we are accepting questions through the chat function of today's uh, webinar platform, and we will get to as many of those questions for uh, Professor Verlin as we can later on uh, in the Q&A session the end of our time. All right, so over to those results and thank you for the two thirds of our listeners who participated today. Let's see what Excellent. you had to say. Wow, okay, this was a very clear win um, that suggests there is not an effect. Wow. Depending on the route of application. How did they do, Professor? They're, they're spot on, so that's really great. 
and Great. which makes it very easy for me. So if we go back to the presentation, please. then yes, the same effect was actually shown in pigs when the antibiotics were given systemically. And early antibiotic usage also increased the risk of colonization of the tonsils with antibiotic resistant salmonella and supported their spread. So take home message really is early antibiosis, independent of the way it's given, has a negative effect on the development of the microbiome in piglets and subsequently also a negative effect on the development of the immune system. And for me, really, the um, let's call it the most shocking effect is that these effects last for a very long time, which is probably due to epigenetics. So this is the interaction of the environment with the expression of specific genes. So, which brings me to some sort of last food for thoughts. There is some um, a microbiome gut brain axis. So when we have um, in our gut a good feeling and napping after a nice Sunday dinner, then we are feeling well. And the reason why we're feeling well is because our microbiome actually feels well. In contrast, patients with irritable bowel syndrome are indeed a lot more anxious and irritable. We have certain lactobacilli, which activate GABA, which is one of the main um, ZNS inhibitory neural transmitters. And it has been shown that the production of GABA correlates with irritable bowel syndrome. So if you give this specific lactobacilli in um, people with irritable bowel syndrome, it reduced the stress-induced corticosteroid levels, but that was not the same in germ-free pigs or after cutting the vagus nerve in colonized mice, which means that there's a direct link via nerve endings from the gut into our brain. And antibiotic um, application reduces specific um, microbiome bacteria. And this actually had impact on the development of other micro, microbiota, which increases hypocampal factors that control exploring behavior in mice. And also suggested that um, in germ-free mice, as there was no effect seen, is that this antibiotic treatment really disrupted the gut-brain axis. Similar results were shown in experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis in the mouse model. Um, here we had other um, microbiome strains which had a positive effect. So I think that over the next years to come, we can see a lot of new treatment strategies coming up where we're trying to impact on our well being by impacting on the gut microbiome. And one of the major components seen in here was that actually, when you have no microbiome, you increase as a level of stress hormones. So first here, oh, let me get my pointer working again. First here, um, ACTH, um, no microbiome, you restrain the mice, and you can see that in the germ-free mice, ACTH levels are increased dramatically over those which have an SPF microbiome. The same for corticosterone, and you can also um, summarize that when you have one as, as a bar diagram, with one hour um, restrained germ-free mice, eight weeks after in inoculation, six weeks after inoculation or SPF, you can see that SPF, which have a specific microbiome added to them, they have clearly the least stress hormone levels being produced. So what does it all tell us? I think it's fair to say that we can use prebiotics and probiotics to increase 
the number of bifidobacteria and lacid actic um, producing bacteria. Bran can be a source of that. In, in humans, they have shown that raw food can be a really good source of that. And we have specific probiotics ingested microorganisms which are associated with beneficial effects in human and animals. We have about 50 species of lactobacilli. We have about 30 species of bifidobacterium which are currently really sequenced and we have a better understanding of what can be done. And I think this provides us with new ways forward to maintain the welfare and health of animals. How do probiotics help with the good versus the bad bacterial circumstances? So <clears throat> I think we have to distinguish here between the usage of probiotics. So either the use in healthy subjects to maintain good health or the therapeutic restoration of the microbiome. In the first instance, if you take a lot of probiotic bacteria, you can see this is really quite um, a number of bacteria you need to eat, then you still only have one probiotic bacterium to between 10 to between 1,000 and 10 million resident bacteria. If you use the same treatment to in antibiotic depleted um, gastrointestinal tract, then you have a ratio from about 10 to one probiotic to 10 or one probiotic to 1,000 um, microorganisms. So that means that in healthy, animal, in healthy animals, the diet may have a greater effect on the microbiome than the use of probiotics. Now that may not be something which um, is very positive for the feed industry. However, if you really think about intensive production conditions and the likelihood is that all of these animals are stressed and none of them really has a very healthy microbiome, which means that the addition of probiotics in such conditions would be helpful and you can impact on the microbiome through just impacting on the um, diet. You can impact on the microbiome with the addition of um, probiotics as well. So do probiotics work on healthy animals or healthy adults? This is um, a systemic review published in 2016 on healthy human individuals. In red, the ones with no probiotics. In blue, the one with um, probiotic intervention after the perturbation. And in lilac, the probiotic, which supports a more rapid return to normal bacteria. And I think what's fair to say is that without any perturbation, you have no impact on the bacterial composition in the gut at all. They are actually 100% similar. And after a while after the perturbation, it goes back more or less to the same microbiome composition you had before the perturbation. So in healthy individuals, addition of probiotics without any perturbation is not really beneficial. In pigs, they have shown that in contrast, if you eat, if you provide Bacillus pumilis in probiotic feed, in the conjunction with a Lausonia intracellularis infection, this is the study protocol they used. Here's the exposure to Lausonia intracellularis. Here are the different um, probiotics given. And what they showed here is that that addition of probiotics, of this specific probiotics, under the um, infection of Lausonia um, intracellularis really mitigated the effect. It caused less shedding of, of Lausonia intracellularis and less lesion. So here we have the clear evidence that if you have a perturbation and you provide a probiotic feed from the beginning on in a situation where you know that the pigs may become infected, then clearly the probiotics have an effect. And they could show that um, in the um, copy number of Lausonia intracellularis, 
these are the ones with the least um, effective probiotics. Here are the ones with the most effective probiotics. And you can see that there's hardly any, any shedding going on. So in summary, I think it's fair to say that our microbiome develops during or straight after the birth process and is subject to age-related changes. The microbiome plays a, an absolutely crucial role in the development of the gut, the gut immune system, and potentially the development of the brain. Early antibiotic therapy has a massive impact on the development of the microbiome and probably through epigenetic effects, this is very long lasting. Some pathogens impact on the composition of the microbiome to enhance their own survival. And this can potentially be counter-regulated through the application of probiotics under such circumstances. So let's go back to the question I um, posed to you at the beginning that the way to a man's heart is through food. So what has it to do? Well, it's very simple. If you get good food, your microbiome is happy. If your microbiome is happy, you have no stress. If you have no stress, your immune system is happy. If your immune system is happy, you have a positive brain association with that person that gave you the good food. So there you have it. Good food keeps us happy and keeps a healthy relationship. And with that, I thank you for listening and I'm happy to answer any question now. Thank you very much. All right, thank you for those remarks. Uh, we have a great set of questions that have already come in okay. from the audience. So let's go ahead and get started with uh, the first one. Um, earlier on when we were uh, asking the audience uh, for their views, we talked about the, the avenue of application of antibiotics. Um, we had a question here about whether antibiotics given to lactating sows have the same impact on piglets as a direct antibiotic use on the piglets. Um, <clears throat> so the theory is that if the antibiotics show up in the colostrum, then yes. But that's why you have um, the withdrawal time of the antibiotics. So if you give milk or colostrum after that period of the withdrawal period, then they should not have an impact on that. However, if you have antibiotic residues in the colostrum, then yes, it is very likely they also have an impact on the colonization of the offsprings of the newborn. All right. Um, this, this talk of microbiome, this is a a hot topic, right, in the swine industry. Yes. How important is this at farm level? What kind of differences, what kind of changes, improvements can we, could uh, a practitioner expect on their side in terms of health or performance? What are your yeah. thoughts? Um, so this is currently something which is really hotly investigated. And I think um, what it comes down to is economic factors. Um, and what I mean by economic factors is not only the monetary side, but also points such as energy expenditure on the piglet side. So think about the following situation. Every infection causes an immune response. An immune response goes hand in hand with energy consumption. For example, if you need to increase your body temperature by one degree, you have to raise your basal energy turnover somewhere between 15 and 30 percent. Now if you think about this in the period of the piglet, either at the beginning it has to grow very fast to be able to forage for food for itself or in the weaning period, then what we would like to see is that that energy expenditure based on an unnecessary immune response is really kept extremely low. So here having the right microbiome in the gut is really important to maintain the health of the animal, therefore reduce the energy expenditure. And if you reduce the energy expenditure, then all other parts fall into play as well. So you have your expected average daily weight gain, you have your expected food conversion ratio, which means the piglets are growing as they expected, which at the end impacts on your wallet as well. Right. Uh, two questions that we've got here that uh, I think we could tie into the, those remarks. Um, okay. 
First, have you seen or are you aware of any correlation between the presence of a healthy microbiota in newly born piglets and their birth weight? Any relationship to, uh, that you're aware of there? No, not yet. Okay. And the so second I think, one. So, sorry, oh, I think um, this affects more the sows. So I think here the genetic of the sow is more important. I would say though that the tendency to have sows which have you know 15 piglets or more um, is may not be the best because we do not have enough teats which then potentially impacts on the development of the piglet but again this is not the birth weight of the piglet this is more sort of the initial daily weight gain ratio on the piglet straight after birth okay and you, you also spoke about this trade-off between uh, a, an immune response and growth, uh, particularly yeah. for piglets. Um, what, so here the question is, what do you think uh, is the right strategy with the microbiome and in the intestinal immune system? Should you look to trigger activation or immunomodulation, which okay. would be more effective? Yeah, so um, I think what is shifting at the moment is our understanding that in a healthy gut, we have no immune response. That's actually not right. What happens in the healthy gut is that we have a dampened immune response so that our immune system has no reaction to the commensal bacteria. Yeah? And this immune response is dampened by these regulatory T cells. So as soon as something foreign comes along, then this dampening effect goes away and we have an active immune response yeah, targeted against this pathogen. So what you do not want is really a shutdown, a completely zero immune system in the gut because it takes too long to get this activated. So what nature has done really is, is said, okay, I maintain some bit of immune response to ensure that we have not an overshooting immune response to those bacteria we need, but we can react without any delay if we have something negative happening. So here, I think maintaining a good positive commensal microbi microbiome is really, really crucial to not only um, diminish the effect on potential negative bacteria, but also to allow the immune response to react in the most appropriate way if something negative comes along. Does that answer your question? I, I believe so. So it, it, it does sound... Um... I think intuitive to me that a healthy gut functions well, if yes. I understood your remarks properly. That's, that's really, if you want to boil it down, a healthy gut has an immune response all the time. Yeah, it's not zero, it's just dampened. We need to maintain this very low immune response to be able to react. And if you think about it, commensal bacteria also can turn into nasty bacteria if they show up on the wrong side of the gut. Okay. Uh, we have questions here. Now, I know that you've certainly touched on it in your remarks, but uh, what ways uh, do producers, practitioners have to improve uh, a pig's microbiome composition? That's, um, uh, that's an evening filling discussion, uh, which would be really nice to do over a dinner, but uh, we can't do that. So I'm trying to be brief here. I think you have a lot of impact there. I think it really is crucial that your sows are healthy. And I think here we can add specific feed additives in to maintain a good healthy microbiome in the sows. I think it's absolutely crucial that you have a fairly stress-free birth process, um, which does not stress out the newborn piglets too much, which allows them to pick up the good microbiome of the mother. So. If you want to answer that bluntly, I think it goes back to if you have good management and a good general animal welfare system and animal health system, you're doing all the right things already. Excellent. Okay, um, you've mentioned, let's see, feed additives. You had touched on prebiotics and probiotics. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about botanicals or plant-based phytogenic feed additives? Have you seen 
any similar effects uh, from those categories of products in the swine? Yeah, so there's um, a large volume of articles in that direction coming in last years out of China. Um, Unfortunately, no one in the Western world has yet tried to reproduce them. So I can only say um, from these articles, there is seems to be effect. So some people or some groups used green tea extracts, um, which apparently had a positive effect. Some groups used soybean extract, which had apparently a positive effect. Um, the confirmation of that is still missing, so I would say watch the space. Absolutely, and I'm sure we will do so. Um, I'm pretty I'm sure, get, yes. We, we are getting close to the end of our Q&A, um, and this is a rather large question, so feel free to, to just give us the highlight reel of the answer. Okay. Um, what are the challenges and opportunities to improve pig gut health? Okay, I think um the opportunities so the challenges we have is that we have to stop by law now um using a how to say that a prophylactic antibiotic treatment in piglets that really throws a big spanner in the system because a lot of our production facilities are more or less relying on this now where i see the big positive side of that is that if we are able to replace the antibiotic usage with using specific probiotic strains to maintain gut health and therefore maintain the welfare of the piglets then theoretically that should have a huge effect on the animal welfare on food safety because we have less antibiotic residues we have less bacterial strains with increased antibiotic resistance but also theoretically the probiotics should be a lot cheaper to add compared to the antibiotics which means that there should be also an impact on the economy for the pig producers but that means, in my opinion, also that we have overall from the consumer through the whole food chain to the producers a rethink on how we approach treatment of diseases. I think that a combination of probiotic treatment and vaccination strategies is the way forward. And I'm pretty sure that if we get money from the governmental funding bodies to invest in this area, then I think we can do a lot with probiotic food additives to improve animal health and can get rid of the antibiotics. You certainly touched on um, some important elements in, uh, that are pressing upon the industry these days. Yeah. Uh, I also wanted to ask, we have a couple of questions regarding uh, favorable microbiome um, or even probiotic application and a link to behavior. Uh, for example, yeah. is it possible to reduce tail biting? Have you seen anything to that well, effect? See, this is a really interesting question. So based on these mouse studies, there are currently studies going on where um, people are looking at the composition of the microbiome and stress situations such as tail biting. And the studies just started, um, I think, two years ago, so there's no data yet. However, what we have seen in a study we did was that in each um, piglet group, you have more or less two sort of areas within the group which are really under constant stress. One is the alpha animal because it's constantly bettered on for his status. One is the omega animal, so the lowest in the low um, because everyone is picking on him. And what we realized is, and again, this is an ongoing study, but it seems that the addition of the right food with a probiotic component at the appropriate time of development has a calming effect on that. So rather than having only two changes over the masting period in, in the diet, we applied um, five different changes in the diet and that 
seems to fulfill the needs of the animals better and therefore they kept calmer. Oh wow, okay. Now, whether, well, whether, whether, whether this really pans out on a large scale, that needs to be seen. But at least it seems that the studies done in mice and some studies done in, in humans really point to that, that over a good composition of a microbiome, you can impact on stress levels as well. Great. Um, that, that sounds promising. It'll be curious to see how that um, knowledge uh, develops in that yeah. direction. Um, I would be amiss to hold a session here uh, for our swine audience and not ask a question about ASF. It will be yes. our last question. So thank okay. you for everyone who submitted a question. Uh, we will find a way to follow up and get back to you. For those of you who have not had a chance to get an answer during today's Absolutely. session. Absolutely. Uh, so the question here, uh, do you have any knowledge of advanced studies, um, recent news on how to prevent ASF, particularly as it relates to microbiome perhaps? Yeah, so there's not really yet um, interaction. There are no really studies going on regarding the interaction of the microbiome and ASF. I think ASF is such a black box still at the moment that um, this will come down the line. However, there are currently two vaccines in trial, one produced here in England, one produced in China, which seem to work quite well. And the interesting part of these vaccines is they're not only working on homologous strains, so they also cover heterologous strains, so they cover more than one ASF strain. And that would be really a massive breakthrough if that can be can be really shown. Absolutely. Um, and I'm sure everyone will uh, stay tuned for more developments on that front. Um, Dr. Velian, I want to thank you for your remarks, for sharing your knowledge You're with us. You're most welcome. Being here. Uh, I want to thank our audience as well for their attention, for their great questions that they've uh, asked during today's session. Uh, one of the things I do want to highlight is that we will be back in three weeks from now um, to continue on the topic of welfare. Uh, so on July 21st, uh, please go ahead and look for that invitation. Go ahead and register. Uh, it's currently open uh, as our series on antibiotic reduction continues into part eight of July 21st. Uh, once we close this session, it would be great if we can have your feedback uh, to let us know what you liked, what you'd like to see in the future, ways we can improve. Uh, so please take two minutes to fill out that short questionnaire and we will hopefully be hearing from you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for joining in on this morning. And um, I guess I can only wish you to stay healthy and um, wash your hands and social distance and all these kind of things. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Thank you. And on behalf of Biomin, thank you all. Take care. Okay. Thank you.